Thanks, Ali, and hello, everyone. Uh, sorry for the delay. My apologies. I wanted to spend a few minutes with you to, uh, today, tonight, uh, just talking about some of the work that we've been doing and some of the uh, frameworks that we're using to uh, help with uh, the effectiveness of leaders in several uh, organizations we're working closely with. And I want to share with you this initial slide that shows, uh, in, in fact, our logo, the logo for our MESA research group. MESA, by the way, stands for Management Education Services Associates. So that tells you what we do. And the logo may say something to you as well. Perhaps it uh, potential meaning if you just look at it as a graphic image. It, uh, it specifically refers to the notion of a S-curve, a sequence of S-curves, in fact. And it reflects, in fact, the difficulty in transitioning from one role to the next one. It can also apply, frankly, to uh, organizational effectiveness, strategic effectiveness. But we're speaking here uh, specifically now with regard to management and leadership effectiveness. Uh, when you move from one role to the next. And, and we usually apply this in the context of a career path for, uh, for leaders at various stages in their careers. The notion here is very important that we may indeed have become very skilled, uh, very effective, very productive in the role that we are in at present. Uh, that would be indicated by the high end of the S-curve. Uh, as we move into a new role, uh, we often find that those skills that made us successful in our previous role can, in fact, be counterproductive in that new role. Let me give you a specific example. Imagine an individual who has been a very successful individual contributor in your organization. Uh, if someone succeeds as an individual contributor by being what we call a workhorse, by doing uh, large amounts, we could even say, you know, significant, massive amounts of work, individual work, task work. Uh, these, these individuals can get a lot done. When you become a new supervisor, that tendency, the tendency to attack all task work in sight, get it all done, get it done uh, on time uh, to your standards, is pretty much exactly the opposite of the focus you'd like to see with a supervisor. Supervisor needs, of course, to be delegating work, not to be doing the task work himself. And so you need to shift, obviously, from a task focus to a people focus, from a doing work to a managing work, if you will. And we often find that individual contributors who don't make a transition, who attempt to continue to do things as they have done in the past, really struggle with that uh, role of, of supervisor and manager. So we've indicated here uh, the red circle on this, this chart indeed is a transition cycle, uh, period between the two cycles. And in these transitions, very important to uh, reflect and think about the position you'll soon be going into and think very carefully about the kinds of skills and the kinds of qualities that are going to be important for success in that new role. So we think of this now partially as a situation where contextual intelligence is very important. We have to assess the context. We cannot assume that things are going to be exactly the same in this new position as they were in the prior position, and we have to make some personal adjustments, if you will. Uh, perhaps it's a similar situation with minimal adjustments, but as you go through a leadership career, you are certainly going to find yourself in positions which require very different leadership skills and style. Uh, and we have to have the intelligence to identify the requirements of these positions so we can adapt to them. Let me show you a specific example uh, of what I mean. Here. Imagine now moving to a new position. Here's one dimension of that new position we, we want to think about, and it's specifically this. Uh, let's look at this new position very carefully from one perspective for a moment. That is, uh, 
how much knowledge and competency do I have myself in this new position? Is it an area where I have very high knowledge, very high competency, where I really am an expert, if you will, in that area, where I, I, I'm, uh, you know, the, the resource, the, uh, the expertise that, uh, that, that we can draw on in making decisions in this new area? Uh, that would be indicated by high knowledge and competency self at the top. And now let me assess the team that I'm going to be working with in that new role. Is it a team that itself has very high knowledge and competency? I, I break those two out, by the way, knowledge and competency, for this reason. Uh, competency, you can think of in a general sense as well as a specific sense here. Knowledge specifically relates to this area that we're going to be working in. So you might have a team that is very knowledgeable of this area and very competent in this area. And it may also be important to think of the team as being high knowledge uh, and high general competency. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Now, let's assume we go into a situation where we have now uh, not very high knowledge or competency in this specific area. So we're moving into a new area, in fact, an area we don't know too much about. Fortunately, however, we uh, are able to assess and determine that the team we're taking over as a manager has very high knowledge and competency in this area. That's a very positive situation, obviously, but uh, sometimes difficult for a manager who's coming from an area where they, in fact, are the smartest and most competent person in the room. All of a sudden, you're going into an area where you have very limited knowledge about the uh, activities of the team and very little specific competency about that area. Now, thinking about that, what we would suggest here for starters, the lower right-hand quadrant of this chart, in that situation, we would uh, certainly emphasize the importance of personal, of building personal relationships. Very important in this situation because you're going to be relying on the team uh, for information, for knowledge, for decision making, or at least supporting decision making, and for getting things done. So in this case, personal relationships are going to be particularly important and probably the first thing you would focus on in some depth, perhaps more than you would otherwise in this type of situation. In this role, you're going to be both learning or primarily learning and leading, but it may be difficult to use a traditional leadership style when you don't have the expertise, you don't have the knowledge and the specific competencies to draw upon. Therefore, the leadership style recommended here is one of facilitating the team, drawing upon the knowledge of the team, the skills of the team, and facilitating team decisions and team actions so that you'll continue uh, to perform well while you learn all you can about the business. This is a, a, a very uh, experience that all of us are going to have at some point in our leadership careers, right, to go into this type of situation. Uh, where we don't know very much. Uh, you may want to anticipate exactly how to be most effective in that situation. Look forward to any questions as we go along, by the way. I wasn't sure about the format. I'll leave for questions. We'll leave some time at the end, but if there's an opportunity for questions uh, in a bit here, we'll take that. So uh, we'll talk a bit about... Yeah, yeah I think, we, I think uh, Bill, you can go ahead in, a, uh, in a one stretch, and we'll take the questions in the end once we finish it. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, so let me then talk a bit about the uh, upper right-hand box in this in this uh, in this uh, matrix. This is a very interesting one. Imagine a situation where you yourself have very high knowledge, very high competency about the specific area in which you're working, and your team also does. So you you have an uh, uh, embarrassment almost, right, of resources here. Here I want to suggest is the perfect opportunity for practicing empowerment. Here you have high knowledge and competency. That's also your team does. This is a situation where you may want to shift from a model where you have made all the decisions because you have the highest knowledge and competency to one where you're allowing your team, in fact, to make most of the decisions. This can be an extremely uh, effective 
in uh, energizing and motivating a team. So as you think about an empowerment model, and this is a model where the leader purposefully steps back uh, and allows the team, in effect, to come out and lead, it's a, it's a situation where we practice forbearance. That is, for example, uh, something comes up, I know the answer. I don't give the answer as a leader. I ask my team, knowing that they are quite competent, they'll come forward. So this is a, a situation where you can really develop the individuals on your team and really focus also on bringing them together as a team through empowerment. And I believe you'll find, in many cases, these are the special times in one's where you have very high-performing teams, very positive energy. Uh, a lot of positives can come out of this situation. At the same time, uh, you want to be a little careful in a situation like this about using a style that may have been effective in the past, which is more directive. And no chart we're suggesting here, a situation where you have high knowledge, your team does not. This is a situation where indeed you're going to want to use a more directive style. You will do this and you will do it this way. At the same time, uh, you're doing as much teaching as you can, uh, sharing your knowledge, your expertise with the team to help bring them along. That style uh, is very different than the one you would use in the upper right. Uh, that style will likely be somewhat counterproductive uh, with a very competent team. Necessary for a team of individuals who don't have the same level of competency, don't have uh, the knowledge that you do. So again, think about how your style needs to adapt based on these different situations. As you go into your next role, think about how that new role fits into this quadrant. You're going to have to think about your team and yourself and then how your style will best be uh, calibrated to maximize your effectiveness. Let's mention just briefly the lower left. You go into a situation where you don't know much and your team doesn't know much. Hopefully you don't go into those situations. You know, try to avoid that if at all possible. Right? So you are starting off without much knowledge uh, or expertise and your team also. I've seen this. We've seen where we have a, a new manager coming into a team of new hires uh, in a role with, with, without any, any experience or expertise and it can be a disaster. It's really tough on the, on the manager, on the leader. If you find yourself in this situation or even partially in this situation, you must seek outside help. You don't look to your team, obviously. You've got to seek outside help. Maybe there's a parallel team. Maybe uh, it's a mentor. Maybe you have to go outside the organization, but you've got a big challenge here. Obviously, uh, to bring yourself up to speed as quickly as possible and uh, then work on developing your team. So that's uh, one view. That's just a single dimension, but what we're suggesting here is very important to understand the new role you're going to go into and adjust your style accordingly. This is very important. There's another key point here we want to be thinking about as you're moving into a new role. Let's think of it this way. Who am I working with is very important. I hope you can see this, uh, this graphic. And as you look at it, look carefully at it because it's designed to mention to make a point. Uh, we have to be thoughtful about who it is we're working with and how we can best interact with them to be effective. I hope you see the two faces. Do you see them? There's one looking straight at us and the other one is a side view. And so this is just a simple graphic to help us remember we have to be careful about preconceptions, about perspectives, and thinking about who we're working with. This is particularly important should you be making one of the typical transitions that most of us are going to experience, and that is moving from a position of being a local manager, largely working in a single country, in a single culture, as a manager, to someone who's working in a global matrix organization, in a global team, uh, you know, with third parties, you know, where you begin to bring in some of the uh, some of the diversity 
that we see in any global organization. There we have to be extremely thoughtful about each of the people that we're working with and begin to gain some sense of who they are so we can interact with them most effectively. I want to show uh, a, a model uh, around, uh, around engagement themes and it, it's very uh, similar, it's a kind of a working model from uh, two key dimensions that you'll see in the Myers-Briggs uh, inventory, uh, you'll see it in the GlobeSmart inventory, two key dimensions that I find useful in thinking about uh, how to approach different individuals that you might be working with uh, in a diverse team. Uh, and this model is one that I think you may be familiar with with, but it talks about uh, two key qualities, uh, the uh, vertical one here, extrovert and introvert qualities, and the horizontal, rational and intuitive. And as we look at this, I want to say that uh, I spend most of my time working today, uh, my primary client is a large integrated uh, global oil company, and roughly 70% of the people in that organization test profile into the lower left quadrant here, uh, the, the rational and introverted uh, personalities. This is uh, not atypical of uh, engineering function, by the way. As you think about this, as you're interacting with people of this sort, really the most important messages, the most important hot buttons, the themes that we want to engage people around tend to be the ones right here that we've listed on the page, uh, integrity, uh, of process, integrity of operations, quality, uh, excellence, again, of operations. Uh, these kinds of themes may also, of course, be relevant for an audit function, uh, if you will, uh, quality control, uh, you know, a variety of different functional areas. You would tend to see this type of mindset. And what I'm suggesting we need to do, uh, we need to identify the kind of people we're working with, make sure we understand what's important to them, and then try to engage them around those themes. Uh, a very important one, I'm in Asia uh, at the moment, a very important set of themes in Asia in particular is the lower right quadrant in this chart. I think some of you hopefully will uh, understand what I'm getting at here. There are organizations, there are cultures, there are, there are functions where togetherness, where the bonds that hold groups together are really the most important thing in organization life and, and in life in general. So these are, these are people who, uh, who, whose philosophy would say, I don't care what you know until I know that you care. You have to build personal bonds, respect for the group, uh, uh, be able to uh, be accepted as a group member, and then have the highest level of respect for that team, for that group, as a group. That's your first task in working with people in these categories. I find many operating teams, many field teams, operations, really fall into this category. It depends to some extent on which national culture we're talking about. Certain Asian cultures in particular are very strong. In, in, represented in this quadrant and especially in the, in the field operations and operations manufacturing uh, areas. The upper right hand quadrant is the fun one, one of the fun ones, uh, and we normally associate this with, uh, with the sales and marketing organization. These are folks who really respond to this notion that we are going to do something special as a team. We're going to make history, we're going to create a legend, we're going to achieve the extraordinary. Uh, a lot of fun, frankly, I find. To work with people like this, there's a lot of energy here. If you can tap that energy, if you can uh, get it focused, uh, sustain it, uh, really remarkable things can happen. Over on the far left, these are the bankers, the finance guys, uh, and uh, the messages there are, we're going to win, we're going to beat the enemy, we're going to make money, and we're going to do it this year. Right? Those are the kinds of themes. Let me show you how one great leader that I know uh, uses this model to engage the various parts of his organization in a very special way. 
I want to ask if you wouldn't mind just to ponder, uh, uh, has anyone in the room uh, been through the Delhi airport in India prior to 2010? No, we probably can't take the answer, but uh, just think if you have, think about the Delhi airport pre-2010. And then I'm going to ask if anyone's been in the Delhi airport in the last two years. And hopefully one or more of you will say, I can say yes to both. I was there before 2010, and I was there in the last two years. The reason I make that point is that Delhi in the year 2010 was ranked 124 out of the top 125 airports in the world by the IATA, the International Aviation Transport Association. Uh, essentially the worst major airport in the world. I'm not sure which the worst one was, 125, there was one worse, but it was, it was the worst I have experienced, let me put it that way. Uh, however, last year, Delhi was voted the second best airport in the world after Singapore. It's an extraordinary story, and the executive who led that effort, his name is uh, Bangalore B.S. Shanta Raju, very impressive individual. Uh, I spent a week with him to uh, try to understand how he achieved uh, the impossible. Uh, and it was, it was really quite extraordinary. But more importantly, he has taken on a new role now as CEO of a company called Indus Tower in India. Indus Tower is the largest mobile communications tower infrastructure company in the world with about 140,000 uh, mobile wireless towers in India. They're now expanding into Africa as well. Very interesting company. And I want to show you what this individual did at Indus Tower when he came into the company. Uh, here's an example of his messaging to the various parts of the company. In the lower left, uh, he says Indus Tower is an engineering company, first and foremost. Uh, he raised the target of saying we would like to have 90% of our towers be available at Six Sigma levels, which means they're only down a couple of hours a year. Impressive in a country with, with uh, very, uh, as you know, erratic electricity. Yeah, to keep these sites up requires, for example, that all the, uh, all the diesel generators are functioning and that no one has stolen the diesel fuel from the tanks in these remote areas. A very difficult challenge, but they have moved up in the last two years from about 30 percent of their towers at this level to almost, in fact, 89 percent of the towers now functioning, now available uh, at six sigma levels. Indus Tower is also the most efficient mobile telecom infrastructure in the world, the lowest cost telecom infrastructure in the world, and they're proud to consider themselves engineering leaders in the uh, mobile infrastructure arena. Uh, you've got a very engaged and very motivated engineering and operations team there. Uh, uh, top left, also Indus Tower is the number one tower company in the world, number one in India, and they have created extraordinary financial value in that company in recent years. Perhaps more importantly, though, for many of the members of the organization are these purpose points, these missions uh, that they emphasize greatly inside and outside the company. We bring communications to everyone. And as you probably know, uh, there are now pushing, pushing one billion uh, mobile phones in use in India. Very high level of penetration in this country. In a country where only about 10% of people have uh, wireline telephones. So wireless is a lifeline for the nation. It's a driver of rural development in that country. And there is great energy and passion around these missions as well in the organization. And great external recognition of the company uh, in terms of what it's done uh, for India. Let me take one more to show you again. This is how, this is a leader in action, right? highlighting these themes, engaging in the people in these various areas around what's important to them. Down in the lower right, when Shantaraju came into Indus Tower, the prior year, 
there had been 136, I think, fatalities in the company's uh, operations. Remember, they've got 140,000 wireless towers. There's a lot of high-rise uh, steel construction and uh, service, servicing and maintenance requirements, uh, and India is a hazardous place. 136 fatalities. He implemented a program, a safety program, that had a, a very, uh, very interesting component to it. They call it the Emotional Connect Meeting. This started with fatalities. Imagine uh, that there has been a fatality. The company organizes a meeting to honor that individual, but to bring that person's family into the room and the peers of that person in the company into the room to discuss what happened and also to reflect on the consequences, the family company consequences of that accident, that incident. Uh, they continue to do this uh, very aggressively, even though their fatality rate declined from 136 down to just six uh, last year. That's in, in, in a two-year period. It went from 136 to six. They continue to use this model, though, of emotional connection in the event of any safety incidents of any significance and talk about now what would happen to the family. They actually have family members speak and say, what would, it, what would life be like if you know, our father or our husband uh, were to pass away, were, were to die in the course of his, of his work activities? They have peers speak. The individual speaks. Uh, it's an extraordinarily powerful process. Uh, you could have done this whole safety process in the lower left model, right? You could have used a engineering approach to it which would have been probably, frankly, it wouldn't have had any emotional component to it. It would have been mechanical, sterile. This is done with a very strong emotional approach. And the message is, we, this is a member of our family. You are a member of our family. The family is very important to us. It's an emotion. This is a, a, a very powerful message for someone you know, who is rooted in this lower right-hand box. I, I, I bring this up to show uh, that leaders at a very high level, of course, uh, are working in multiple contexts and they want to use multiple messages and multiple style, in fact, to a great extent in dealing with different constituencies in the organization, different parts of the organization. When you're speaking to the whole organization, you have to touch each base. You have to touch each base and say each of these things are very important. Powerful communications uh, usually contain more than one or two of these different types of messages. So there's another example of the kind of assessment we have to do as a leader. Who are we working with? Who are we talking to, whether it's a group or an individual? Uh, who is this person and how can I best engage them? Uh, what's important to them, uh, how do I inspire them. These are the kind of messages that are most important for leadership effectiveness. One of the companies that I work with, I've worked with for some time, has a leadership framework that I find very interesting. They list six qualities of successful leaders in their organization. The first five are very typical, frankly, integrity, people focus, customer focus. The sixth one is unique, never seen it anywhere else. They say, we want leaders in our organization who are lucky, lucky people. So I asked the head of HR, what do you mean by lucky people? Well, there are certain people in our company that we've noticed, no matter where we put them, good things happen. Everywhere they go, good things happen. Therefore, they are lucky. I hope you'll see the, the real message here. That is, uh, we make our own luck to a very great extent, don't we? Uh, we call it luck because we have a hard time specifically identifying the skills and qualities of really effective leaders. What I want to suggest to you is in what we're describing here, 
we begin to get at some of those skills and qualities. Much of this depends on our, again, contextual intelligence, right? Our ability to assess where we are and who we're working with, and then to adapt our messages and our style to be most effective in that situation. So we say good leaders assess, adapt, and then act. The bad leader is someone who we call a, a, a hammer who only knows nails. Right? I'm a hammer. I only have one style. Wherever I go, I'm going to hammer the nail. That obviously may work in some situations, but it will not work in all. Good leaders, especially as we move into the global marketplace, right, have to be able to assess and act. And, uh, we talked about a couple of dimensions we need to consider as we're doing our assessments. Of course, specifically in the global arena, we have to be very thoughtful about working with people from other cultures. That's not an appropriate topic for us this evening. Uh, it probably would be the, a, a better topic to be had in itself if you haven't done so already in talking about the ability to work effectively across national cultures. But I would just point out as you as you look at some of these cultural issues, they're also relevant when you're dealing with people from your own culture. People prefer a direct style, some prefer a more indirect. If you're talking with someone you know, from Japan or Thailand or Indonesia, uh, direct style will not work. You better adjust your style, obviously, to the needs of that local, the, the preferences of that local culture. We also find that uh, trust uh, dynamics differ from culture to culture. Some cultures are much more open and ready to trust someone, and others really trust is difficult to, to earn. It doesn't come immediately. It takes some time. That's very important. I would say quickly again here, there's, there's much more that could be said on this topic, but uh, whether or not it's part of a national culture, many organizations, parts of organizations, display uh, kind of a balance between do, getting things done through formal processes versus personal relationships. You may have thought about this before. Some companies Really, it's all about formal processes. And in others, you must, in order to get anything done, must have very significant personal relationships. It's a very important point. Uh, we need to understand this, obviously, in any setting we're in. And of course, uh, the importance of, of relationships is always significant. But in some settings, it's essential. It's really uh, the most important thing. And therefore, uh, successful individuals will be those who are focused on and hopefully good at creating and maintaining a significant set of personal relationships, personal professional relationships. Uh, that's important anywhere, but uh, in some areas more than others. We can talk a little bit more about this, but I'm going to just kind of pull a few more thoughts together here. And then I uh, would like to uh, turn it over to you for any questions, comments, observations, anecdotes, uh, whatever you want to share. So, so let me finish up with a couple more ideas, and then uh, we'll turn it back to you. I want to I put the word pace up here on the chart because uh, in, in my career I've spent probably more time uh, with IBM Corporation than any other company. It's a very interesting company. It's a company uh, dominated really by that uh, upper right-hand culture, uh, the sales and marketing culture. Very interesting place. Uh, a very good, probably the world's greatest sales organization. In doing their research on sales effectiveness and sales uh, leaders' effectiveness in the company, they found something very unusual. They found that the, the best, the most successful salesmen were those who spoke at the same pace as the customer. That was the number one differentiator, the number one factor associated with the success of salespeople at IBM. They spoke at the same pace. What that means is 
if they're speaking to someone who spoke fast, they spoke fast. Someone who spoke slow, they would speak slow. Now, in fact, this finding is really just the tip of the iceberg. What we found is really going on is that these salespeople are carefully analyzing and assessing the customer and adapting their personal style to that individual's preferences. Pace, but message, mindset, style, being adapted to that individual. These, these sales leaders were, in fact, doing a good job, as we see below, of assessing the individual they're working with, adapting, and acting accordingly. Adapting their style, adapting the speed of speech, adapting their orientation to that situation. Uh, we believe that approach will work anywhere. The ability, though there are some skills in here, how do we assess others? How do we adapt? What style, styles do we have in our personal portfolio? How authentic are we about this, by the way? Can't you know, be too, too uh, mechanical about it. But uh, you know, are we able to develop these kind of skills? Uh, and then one final thought. Uh, it is really important to distinguish between you know, vertical styles and horizontal styles. Vertical styles, classic superior subordinate, kind of you're one or the other, right? You adjust your style accordingly. That's, uh, that's mainstream management. But increasingly, of course, more and more of what we do is going to be about horizontal, cross-functional, uh, cross-unit uh, interactions and collaboration. And so here, those vertical styles won't work. Neither one of them will work. You can't really be a superior in that world. You can't. You don't want to be a subordinate. You have to be a team member, a peer, right? And we find in that setting these kinds of skills around assessing individuals, adapting style, very important. Uh, very important to success. We all hear about, you know, uh, influence without authority. Well, you know, that's great, but how do you do it? I want to suggest a very good place to start is with individuals, uh, is assessing individuals, adapting styles to be engaging them, and, uh, and moving from there. So uh, that's a quick summary, and I want to give you just one more piece of work here to think about for those of you who might be at or approaching kind of a you know, relatively new role as a manager or a leader in an organization, some of the things we find that, that tend to work well that pull together some of the themes we just talked about. Um, we find that questioning is a really useful style. Uh, hard to overstate how valuable, how easy this is, but it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental shift in style. Try, if you can, to uh, start some of your interactions with questions. What do you think about X? What are the, what are the things that you're working on right now? Uh, what do you think about you know, this or that idea? Uh, and and, and try, uh, try, try solicitating the inputs of others. You'll learn a lot about them. And then you can adapt to who they are to be more effective. Related to that, as you go up the latter, if you will, in your career, you must be disciplined about this. You should not be doing very much task work at all. At some point, you shouldn't be doing any task work, really. You should be delegating all of it. But you should be doing much, much more work on relationships and investing in relationships at, at all levels. Uh, I would also suggest that focusing on a team, whether it's a formal team or an extended informal team, also very, very helpful in terms of uh, effectiveness and being someone who helps hold a team together in various ways uh, is an invaluable part of the equation. So uh, we're going to ask you also to listen more and talk less. That's uh, particularly true if there are any Americans in the audience. Right? So think about that one if you would as well. Well, there's a series of inputs, some frameworks, some ideas 
some things that you can take and uh, work on right now, tomorrow morning that is, uh, and see if they might uh, improve your luck in your own career path. I'm going to stop there, open it up for questions, comments, uh, and see what uh, you're thinking. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bill. And um, folks, now we are open for the Q&A. Uh, you have two options. Either you could raise your hand. There's a hand icon available on your webinar console. So if you click on it, I'll give you a chance to speak to uh, Bill directly, or you could put your questions in the question box. I see there's a hand already raised, a couple of them, so let me go there one by one. Uh, Brother Basil Mustafa, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank uh, you. Yes, Brother, could you please introduce yourself, where you're calling from, and please ask the question. Um, I'm calling from Oxford in the United Kingdom. And uh, I just came back actually from Malaysia where I was conducting uh, one of these programs of leadership development for civil servants. And I'd like to take Bill back to one of his first slides if I may, Bill. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. Um, the one where you mentioned context and leadership, yes, that's the one. Um, one of the... Uh, uh, participants in my program asked me ask what hello hello yep Can you hear me yes okay I'll, I'll carry on one of the participants in my program asked me what would what would this chart look like for a staff member who is high K um, and and C with a leader or a manager who's low on both, what would be your <laughs> advice to him? <laughs> uh, that's good, Mustafa. Yes, thanks. You know, I think it's a it's an interesting one because uh, in the corporate world, we often see these very experienced, knowledgeable guys who, uh, frankly, then are uh, seeing a new, frankly, often very young manager come into that role, right, who, uh, who doesn't know very much about that situation. And for the company's organization's good, it's very important that, that those two individuals connect. It's very important for the, the young leader to engage that knowledgeable person uh, if there is a potential conflict there, if there is a disengagement, it could be very, very difficult. So uh, I would, uh, I've always thought about the leader's perspective, gee, I have to engage this guy, right? I have to engage him. I have, really have to work with him. And typically that works. So uh, if that knowledgeable person you're talking about isn't getting, frankly, the kind of engagement from the young leader that he or she would want, they might want to start saying some things. Now, in Malaysia, you would you would be very gentle about, it. you know, you'd be quite gentle about the point. You'd have to think of a nice way to say it. Uh, you might start by asking that individual, young leader, some questions. What do you think about that? You know, uh, just to frankly sh let them realize that they don't know much about what's going on, right? So, but. Uh, they might also get to some fairly open conversation about, gee, I, I, I will help you, I'll help teach you, I'll help you learn the ropes here, so to speak, uh, and hopefully they'll get a, you know, a good working relationship going. Um, we would tend to put the burden of that on the leader, the individual, the young leader, the, the, the uh, person who's coming in, not on the person you mentioned, Mr. Clark, you know. Uh, but sometimes, as you know, uh, those individuals do have to take on the burden, and hopefully that young leader doesn't make it too difficult for them, right? Very interesting situation. Thank you. Yes. Comments on that one? Uh, Brother Bat Mustafa, shall we move to the next caller? Or that's you fine. Have a, okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you very much. That's fine. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, let me move to the next caller. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Rashad Faridi. Dr. Muhammad, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, uh, could you please I'm, introduce uh, where you're calling from and ask a question, please? 
Yeah, I'm a assistant professor at uh, business of uh, administration at uh, Riyadh in one of the government universities here. And uh, uh, my quick question uh, for the same context and leadership, uh, Bill, question for you, uh, is that uh, on, the, uh, on the upper left-hand side, uh, when we see that uh, typically, traditionally, when, uh, when the manager is, has a high knowledge and competencies compared to his peers, so it's, don't you think sometimes it's more of an autocratic and uh, non-participative style of uh, uh, leadership? And um, do you think so? Uh, yes, I, I yes I do, Mohammed. Absolutely, and and you know in that situation, that is not um, not necessarily bad. Mm -hmm. You know that's uh, that is the uh, if there is a place where it's appropriate, that's it. Yeah. Right, right there. Uh, okay. Now, mm -hmm. I would, however, note note that I also have on there the teaching model, right? Right. So yeah. we would encourage that person to be developing mm -hmm. that team. So yes, indeed, directing and, and perhaps somewhat autocratic, but mm -hmm. you should also be teaching and developing the team. And over time, your style should adapt as they get better and better. All right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Like that autocratic, uh, maybe um, it will be a boon uh, initially for the organization, you know. And uh, the competence in the knowledge is uh, with the leader, you know. Yes, absolutely. And you know, there there are times when, with young uh, young guys, where you know, they're they may be just fine to take direction, you know, right. because they really don't have problems. Now, you try that autocratic style with the upper right hand team, you're going to have mm -hmm. problems. Yeah, that'll exactly. be counterproductive. Yeah, yeah that will be yeah. more conflicts, you know. Yeah, and it, and try that autocratic style when you don't know anything, when you have low knowledge. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. not going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah. But some people uh, only know the autocratic style, right? So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and a quick uh, second question, uh, Bill, if you can, uh, about the quality circle. If uh, you see that uh, there's a lot of uh, success rate in uh, the eastern part of the world compared to the western part, like is it because of uh, you t we were mentioning about that Asian culture where the, it's more emotional and uh, more attachment and uh, the, is it is one of the factors being success of uh, these uh, quality circles in the eastern side more than as compared to the western side? Absolutely, and you know, Mohammed, when I was a young assistant professor, uh, one of the very first things I did was to go over to Japan and study. It was mm -hmm. at Hitachi Corporation. Right. Uh, you know what? What they call their, you know, their Kaizen teams. Mm -hmm. Wow! I was blown away. I've never seen anything like it. You know. Right. The, mm -hmm. These the, really the the teams, uh, the the quality teams, the Kaizen teams. That was really the center of the organization. That right. was the right. core of the organization. It wasn't yeah, the, yeah, the backbone parallel. Of the it was yeah. yeah. It's just amazing, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it and it, it is a cultural, uh, you know, kind of core element in in Japan in particular, but in Asia, in many parts of Asia, right? They really get these teams to come together. You mm -hmm. give them a mission. They build team Not pride. You. Uh, yeah. Very impressive stuff. I, I think you know what I'm talking about. And yeah, I yes, understand. Uh, very the power of part. quality circles. Yeah. It's like it's um, tremendous, you know. I just want to share one thing that uh, in the higher education here in, in Saudi Arabia and Riyadh, like we started, a, I, I teach strategic management and we, uh, we have started, you know, student quality circle here and I perhaps uh, I will not uh, uh, be uh, boosting for, but we are the one of the uh, few um, universities here who have started the student quality circle. And uh, to let you know, it's, it has done remarkable well in terms of engaging students and perhaps the performance of and the marks and the productivity and the learning outcome has really improved when we initially started and now. Excellent, excellent. I, you know what, I would say that this doesn't always work so well in the mm -hmm. U.S. Uh, you know, the U.S. is, much, is a much more individualistic culture, you know, so right. the, mm -hmm. the, the, the same approach not as effective, so we, we have to think Think about how to adapt it to different cultures. Sounds like you're doing a good job with it there. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bill. Appreciate wow. it. And thanks, Ali, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed, for the, for the question. And uh, let me move to another caller. We have uh, 
uh, Brother Hamad Al Saadi. Brother Hamad, can you hear us? Hello, uh, Brother Hamad. Uh, brother, I believe you have muted your own microphone. Okay, I've unmuted. Hello, Brother Hamad, can you hear us now? Oh, yeah. Yes, brother. Please introduce yeah, yourself. Where are you calling from? And please ask a question. I'm calling from New York. Uh, I'm, my name is Hamid Asadi. Uh, I, I thank you all for, for, for this interesting lecture. Um, I really learned a lot. Um, Oops. Uh, yes, brother, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Um, in terms of um, the next level of leadership, uh, if, if a leader has worked with, for example, um, low um, uh, one type of, of staff is it recommended to 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 for the next level for for his self development to to work with various staffs but like that for example low knowledge low um, competency staff and after that he he can work with for example uh, high knowledge high competency staff so he can that have that transitional leadership or can develop that skill and and and, um, and has a roadmap or have a roadmap to 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 develop his own leadership skills um, um, th that's the question um, I, I know maybe having a variety of experiences and and environment or different countries uh, helps a, helps a lot but is there any recommended tips or advice in, in this regard thank you very much Uh, Bill, you there? Oh, wait a second. Bill got unmuted. Oh, Bill. Bill, you there? Yep, can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can. You can yep, hear can you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Did you hear the question? Oh, or? Good. I sure did, yes. I, and I say uh, thank you, Hamad. You stated that very nicely. You know, um, I was going to mention an example. The This uh, large uh, global oil company that I work for, they purposefully put people into these different situations and, and specifically put them in uh, situations where they don't know anything early, very early in their careers uh, to see if they can adapt, to see if they can make the adjustments uh, because it's, a, it's an engineering cu culture where people start in areas where they're the expert, where they know everything and where it's relatively easy to manage and to use a, you know, a fairly uh, autocratic style to use our earlier word. So they put them very early into situations where uh, they have to learn some of these other skills to su survive, you know, and to succeed. They cannot rely on their technical skills and their technical knowledge. So uh, putting people through a array of different experiences is absolutely part of the game plan, part of the leadership development game plan in a number of uh, of leading companies, you know, that I know, uh, and in fact, that you even in some of them you have very specific kind of sequences, very specific quotas that you have to hit before you can move to, you know, the next level of leadership. Uh, so, uh, building that type of a framework uh, as an organization very important. From an individual point of view, the tips are, you know, really be thoughtful about where you're going, what position you're going to be in, what the context is, what adjustments you have to make. This stuff, you know, you see people make fatal mistakes because they're not thoughtful. You see organizations, you know, uh, really suffer by uh, not being, uh, not having people who can adapt their styles. You get autocratic leaders, you know, who've been successful in one setting, doing the same thing in another where they, they just don't. It doesn't work. So we need to be really smart about this at both levels, the personal level and the organizational level. Thanks. Uh, uh, Brother Hamad, for your question. Um, let me move to the question box now. There's a question from, uh, a sh a rather a short one from Meg Delino. The question is, is there something as balanced leadership? Uh, was the question values leadership? Oh, is there something as balanced leadership? So oh, balanced leadership. Yes. Uh, good question. Uh, 
uh, there's really two ways to think about this. One is, you know, uh, if we're with an individual, we're going to try to adapt to that individual or that team. If it's a, you know, if it's a homogeneous team. But if you look at this chart again, you know, this is balanced leadership in a way because let's say that this CEO has to make a speech to the whole organization. So the balanced leadership says, I'm going to touch, I'm going to speak to each one of these. I'm going to, I'm going to hit each of these messages, I'm going to hit each of these themes, and I'm going, to, I'm going to try to engage each of these mindsets, right, each of these, these ways of, of seeing the world. Uh, so here we are trying to integrate it all together into one, if you will, balanced approach. But at the same time, we're able to go into these different areas. We're able to adapt enough. Um, now, this raises all kinds of challenges, doesn't it, uh, if you're not careful? Because you don't want to lose ever authenticity. But, you know, I think it's, it's, it's possible for most of us to adapt when we're with our male friends, when we're with our wife, our family, our parents, you know, we make those adjustments already. We're adjusting to, you know, these different groups of people that we work with. Same thing in the workplace. So uh, uh, balanced, but uh, having a diverse, an ability to kind of lean in one direction or the other, depending on the situation, I would say. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Um... Okay, we have another caller who has raised the hand. Let me move. Uh, Brother Murat Daoud. Brother Murat, can you hear us? Yes, I hear you. Do you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. There's a bit distortion, but please go ahead, introduce yourself, and ask the question. Uh, excellent. My name is Murat Daoud. I call from Istanbul. I just started as lecturer in public administration. But uh, besides that, I'm a consultant in uh, international development projects and travel a lot. I was interested, I would be interested to hear a little bit more about the experience of that manager in the daily airport of Delhi. What did he concretely do uh, to change that uh, in that dramatic way, the way the airport is organized? We have heard about his uh, success in this Indus Tower, I mean, some applications, measures he took. But do you have any more information about what was done concretely in the airport uh, to achieve? And me, as I'm traveling a lot, I mean, this issue of airport and quality is quite uh, important for me. Thank you. Yes. Yes, good. Uh, may I ask, have you, have you been to the Delhi airport? No, no, never been, never been there. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if anybody in the room has, has or not, but it really was, really was horrible, and, and it's become just excellent. Uh, a couple things. There are a couple things I would say to that. There's mu there's much to say about it, but two key themes on this one. One is that the overriding purpose here was he got everybody involved in this thing to say, "Look, let's prove to our country that India is capable of doing something the best in the world." You know, we don't do the Olympics, we don't do this, but we are going to do, you know, the best airport in the world. So uh, everybody got a very, very strong uh, commitment to this purpose. I think that was a big part of it. So you engaged people at a very deep level, in fact, in the, in the mission to create a world-class airport. And then second, more technically, uh, they, they did a very nice job engineering, again, of breaking down the airport into pieces uh, and then finding who was the best in the world at that piece. And they literally went out and hired, uh, you know, uh, people from the Hong Kong airport, the Singapore airport, the London Terminal 5 airport to bring and duplicate what they had done there in the Delhi airport. So it was a best practice kind of a model combined with this special mission, this special purpose, I would say, were the key themes that made this thing a success. Now, uh, they have set a standard for every one, every other airport, but every other project really in India to say, hey, we can do this. We can be, you know, we can do this at a world-class level. So uh, in a way, it's kind of a historic event for India, this airport, far more important than, you know, just an airport. Brother Murad, uh, 
Do you have any comments? Uh, maybe, yeah, a comment, a, a quick comment on the first uh, setting a goal. I, I mean, I learned from there. I mean, before I'm going into technically uh, finding solutions, uh, what uh, what strikes me is that he came with the solution of setting a very high goal, a very attractive one. I mean, mobilizing people around something um, very uh, inspiring. Yes. Yes, and and then a process, you know, a best practice kind of a model that was practical as well. So, you know, that combination worked really well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Brother Morat, for your question. Now, uh, uh, we have a number of questions in the question box. So let me move. Uh, try to see. Okay, we have another one from Brother Mahmoud Sharaf. Do we need to adapt the model of management every time we move on in our career? Uh, could you repeat that, Ali, sorry? Uh, do we need to adapt the model of management or leadership every time we move on t in our career? Um, I think that's a good question, too. I, I would say the simple answer is yes you know that every situation is going to be a bit different now if it's a really incremental move then uh, you know maybe the adjustments aren't so great but there will be a new team of people there so you know we'll have to be thinking about who are these people that I'm working with so I would suggest the adjustments uh, are probably going to be uh, significant each time and, and in some cases they need to be almost a complete uh, you know adjustment so we have to be prepared to drop some of our old practices that that were successful. You know, nothing harder than that, right? I, I I've been doing this things a certain way, and I've been succeeding. And uh, now you're asking me to try something that something different that I don't feel comfortable with, right? That that's not easy. So we find really I have to I have to say this that one of the qualities we look for in in uh, new leaders in and potential leaders is the ability to be uncomfortable, right? Is to move out of the comfort zone and try different things and try things that they're not very good at yet. Uh, meanwhile, you know, leaving some things that they're very good at. So that's a key quality: uh, the ability to be uncomfortable, the ability, obviously, to adapt, the ability to learn, to adjust. All those things are really important. And, and I'm going to say the answer, I think, is yes, we're going to need to do this every time. Okay, um, thank you very much. Let me move to quickly uh, uh, Brother Umar Bharti. Brother Umar, I've just unmuted your microphone. I know you have posted the question. Hello, brother. Uh, okay, let me mute him. Uh, brother Umar had asked a question. Could you please, uh, Brother Umar, uh, rephrase the question just to make sure that it has little clarity on it. Uh, let me move to another uh, question from Brother Abdul Aziz Al-Maliki. What do you think about coaching leadership style? And as per your experience, what is the most popular leadership style? Oh boy, that's a big question. Uh, you see how valuable coaching can be here when, you, when you're trying to do the assessment and trying to adapt your style. Uh, it's invaluable. It, absolutely invaluable. The problem, the challenge here, and for most people, they have to do this themselves. They have to do it by themselves. They don't necessarily have a coach, you know, who can help them with it. So, uh, if you're fortunate enough to have a good coach who can help you with this, you know, kind of as we said, uh, frequent adjustments, um, and and how to deal with the challenges of every role you're in, uh, that's wonderful. So yes, coaching super. I think you may. Find uh, you have to be your own coach, you know, that may be part of the story, and you may find that you can help others, junior people, and sometimes senior people with coaching as well. Uh, you may have to adapt your coaching style, you know, in those cases as well, but uh, I'd encourage you to do that. Is there one leadership style I think is best? Yes, yeah, the one that I mentioned at the end here. Uh, I think this is probably the best in general uh, right here. Uh, what's missing from this one? Though is uh, the the emphasis on uh, on 
what we just heard from Delhi, which is uh, inspiring goals. You know, being uh, uh, being a bit of a visionary, operations and engaging teams around those goals, those visions, those aspirations. So if you can add that to this, I think that'd be a pretty good start. Uh, another short one from Brother Manzar Alam. Is leadership dependent on resources and environment that it's confronted with? Oh, boy. Yeah, good question. Good question. I appreciate that question. Uh, indeed, you could take a, a very, uh, very important dimension. Here would be the resource dimension as well. Uh, I think it's not as important as the, the, the environment and the people elements of the context. You know, the, uh, the environment here, meaning the business environment that we're in, the uh, people context as well. Resources is indeed very important. And by resource, I think we mean financial resources, not human resources. Uh, so I wouldn't rate it as highly as the other two, but indeed it's a factor that we have to think about very much as we uh, uh, create our, our, uh, our style for a new situation. Hey, uh, all the questions are keep on coming. Another one from uh, Brother Muhammad Ghani. What do you think about the features of up next leader that you suggested have been applied in transformational leadership, which was done in 1990s? I, I, I went in and out a little bit, Ali. Would you mind repeating? I got half of it. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, let me repeat. Uh, so what do you think about the features of an up next leaders that you suggested have been applied in transformational leadership, which was done in 1990s? Uh, not sure if I understood all so clearly. Yeah, max, max leaders, is that what it was? Uh, yeah. Per perhaps, yeah, this is what we are asking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, th I think the um, the transformational leader model uh, is a little bit different than what we're looking at right here, uh, potentially, because often we see the, the transformation leader certainly the most important element uh, in a transformation leader is, is vision, is strategy. Um, but when you look at successful transformational leaders, again, I think you'll find this engagement obviously very important. Uh, and there's a personal, there are some personal relationships, personal bonds that are, that are very significant there. We do find some people who have some natural, who are born with some of these skills. Uh, they do exist. Natural leaders do exist. They, they, it, it, so some of these things that we have to work at would come easy to them. Uh, engaging people, inspiring people, motivating people, uh, uh, creating relationships. So, so for some people, this is easy. Uh, for others, it's a lot of work. We have a lot of work to do to become good at it. But uh, uh, the, we all can aspire to be transformational leaders. But I would suggest, you know, uh, transformational leadership, true transformational leadership opportunities are rare. You know, uh, most of our work is not going to be transformational in the, with a capital T. You know, yes, we, we will certainly make some changes and we'll have initiatives. Uh, but, but truly transformational stuff, uh, you know, that's, that's not uh, everyday work for 98% of us, right? So that's a style uh, that uh, I would say is not your, your mainstream or normal style. Wonderful if you get the opportunity to do it. And if you do get the opportunity to do it, then certainly you weigh very heavily on the, uh, the vision and strategy components, the aspiration components, the energy uh, and obviously all the personal engagement. Good. We have uh, another interesting one uh, on adapting style. Is successful leadership now more about acting or being an actor than being a genuine who you are? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a good question. Remember I mentioned several times in the, in the presentation about authenticity. Um, 
I'm afraid there's much there's much in favor of, of what has been said here. This uh, there, especially in the global arena, you know, you really do have to alter your style dramatically from culture to culture, and indeed, some of that could be seen as acting. Uh, so it's very very important that uh, we not be seen to be just an actor. It's very important. Um, therefore, there's this element of style uh, uh, around authenticity that's that's really important. And, and here's where I think it comes from. Uh, it has to start with a genuine respect for individuals. I would even say for the individual because that's the level at which this works. So if you demonstrate, it's, it's like with a foreign culture. If you demonstrate a respect for it, an interest in it, uh, even if you're not knowledgeable or competent in that culture, people really appreciate it. So again here, if you start with respect for the individual and th therefore what they then see is you, the so-called acting is you making an effort. You're making the effort because you're genuinely interested in this. Per that works extremely well. So, uh, so the the rule is always start with the per always start with the personal part of this. All right, start there and then go go from that. Once your personal bonds are established, then you can go on to uh, the other parts of the puzzle. Good question, a very important one. Thanks. Uh, okay, another one. Uh, I think we can take two more. So just let me take one. Uh, it's on personal relationship. Uh, focusing on personal relationship with your junior team members are very important, as you said. But where do you draw the line which keeps the role intact, keeping my role of seniority does not get jeopardized on the concept of delegate with authority? Yeah. I think um, I, this is a very good point as well. And I would say, uh, you know, the role should it should be there, even in your in these personal relationships that you're developing. Uh, you know, yes, you're two people working together, but you know, even in that regard, I think it's it's important to to keep the role in mind uh, so that you you don't find yourself kind of getting you know out of bounds. The the role should be there. Now, how you do that I think is is important. You you might say, you know, you know, you're my you're a very good friend of mine and I need your advice on how to how to manage my responsibility, you know, as leader of this team, you know, and um, I'm, I have to make the decision, but I really want your input and your best, you know, that kind of thing. So you can remind people about the role, but, and still stay engaged with them. Uh, and by the way, when I say personal, I don't mean, I, I really mean professional personal, not personal personal, if you know what I mean. I think, you know, you don't have to go that far. Uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, to have a, a strong relationship, uh, this, and and that may be part of the line that you're talking about. Once you become, you know, really per personal, uh, then it will be difficult, perhaps, to maintain that role, that position that you have. Thanks. Okay, one last question um, uh, from uh, Mr. Umar Bhatti. Uh, uh, I'm an HR person and I have a command on my field, but the issue is my colleagues and my team don't know HR. So what leadership role I should adopt in this situation? Oh, oh, oh that's a good one. Oh, my. You know, uh, I, I, I'm going to say this, you know, this one is really a challenging one to me because it's, it's a situation that I've been in a few times. And I'm not sure my advice is going to be good here, but I'm going to I'm going to say I'm going to suggest this, uh, and 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 uh, see what you think. I'm going to suggest that you uh, approach the job and the and the training and the development of your team less, depending on whether these are all HR people or if they're extended team members. I would say less from an HR perspective and more from a, a general management perspective. Uh, my experience, we often find that uh, junior HR people will get, will engage and embrace around HR terminology, HR vocabulary, HR perspectives that are 
that are, are frankly sometimes going to separate them from the rest of the organization. And so I think the challenge of a really good HR leader is to bring these people along, uh, developing their HR skills, if you will, but doing so in a mainstream management approach. Now, this sounds maybe a little hard to do. <laughs> I know it's, it's a challenge, but I think you have to look at these guys as, as a, more of a general manager and less of an HR manager. Yes, they need to improve their HR competency, but I think I would approach them as if they were you know, general managers or junior managers in a, in a, in a general management area. This is a really interesting topic. I'd love to talk to you some more about it. I hope that play with that thought a little bit and see if it doesn't uh, uh, lead somewhere useful. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I know there are a couple of more questions, but folks, uh, we have really uh, we're pushed on time. So let us try to conclude it here uh, with a note of thanks to William Davidson. Thank you very much for taking the time to share your uh, presentation and uh, sharing this valuable content and your experiences. Uh, uh, so I would like to thank you on behalf of Mile and any concluding remarks you would like to give before we dismiss out. Oh yes, I want to thank you Ali and thanks everyone for, uh, yeah, I wish we could have done this session in person, it would have been very interesting. Really appreciate these questions, gave me some things to think about. I hope there's an idea or two here that you can use in your practice and your teaching. Thanks again. Thank you very much and certainly would like to invite you one day to the Kingdom for a very face-to-face -face interaction with all the participants and especially uh, thanks to all of those who participated in this live webinar and posted the questions to, and made an interactive experience for all of us. Uh, with that note, I would like to end the webinar uh, with a quick announcement that tomorrow we have Mr. Chris Pierce on the Corporate Governance and Board uh, Practices Improvement. He will be talking at 6 p.m., uh, in fact, 4 p.m. Uh, Saudi Arabian time. So please stay tuned to our community to join in. And we are recording this webinar, which we will be uploading on our YouTube channel and community in the next couple of days, along with a soft copy of the presentation for you to download from our community. Once again, thank you all um, for joining in and special thanks to uh, Dr. William uh, for your presentation. I am, thank you very much. Bye-bye.